The domestic policy review of solar energy was announced by the president on Sunday, May 3rd at Golden, Colorado. The president called for development of an overall national strategy to speed the development and the use of solar technologies. The domestic policy review task force representing 24 federal agencies held a series of meetings nationwide and more than 10,000 people participated. More than 3,000 testified. I'm Eddie Albert, and I'm going to introduce to you just a few of those people. Many people have told us that this technology is impossible and still 50 years away. If someone tells you that, don't believe it. The idea is to be as self-sufficient as possible and get away from the big systems that we can't control. But there are enough people on it now who know what they're doing, who, uh, who are building and installing quality products, uh, and with the prospects of uh, the conventional fuel prices going up, the industry will make it. Look, it will help all of us. It's part of our future. It's the way we have to go for a lot of reasons. Not all of them are economic. Some of them have to do with the quality of our lives. We're reaching our goals here in San Bernardino. It's not easy. It's not easy because I'm a woman and I'm black. But we have to do it. There are a lot of exciting creative solutions. It can be done. That's quite a cast of characters for any film. You'll meet all of them and some others, and you'll discover that uh, even though they may disagree on how to do it or when to do it, they all agree that it will be done. Now, what is this it that they're all talking about? Well, this it is important to me because nothing would grow in my greenhouse without it. It's the sun. And it's important to the people you'll meet here a new breed of American pioneers who represent a sort of a new grassroots interest and awareness in this country that we can get a lot of energy from the sun in lots of different ways and that the individuals, the, the tinkerers, the entrepreneurs can do it themselves. They talk a lot about what they're doing. We're going to hear what they have to say, but they also do a lot. And that's what this is really all about. This is an apartment community in Ventura, California, Ventura del Sol. It's heated by a hydronic system, hot water which is partially heated by solar energy. The man behind this system is Jim Piper. This project is the largest residential solar system in the world. It consists of 254 units, two swimming pools, two recreation buildings, and three laundries. Interspersed amongst its 17 acres, are 22 energy centers, like the one you see here in the background. Essentially, that's where the heat's put into the system, and the dwelling units and recreation buildings are where it's used or taken out of the system. Acceptance of the system in the building industry comes long and hard. The Department of Energy has done a study that says major changes in the building industry require 50 years. We're now into our 13th and we've made some changes already. Here at our plant in Anaheim, you see the culmination of 13 years of development of the equipment used in our system. We manufacture nearly all of the components that are required to put the system together right here. As you can see, the manufacturing process is simple. If it wasn't simple, we wouldn't be able to do it. Essentially, that's because we've had no help from anyone. Uh, we've applied for grants and had those denied. We've applied for small business administration loans and had the same thing happen. So we've done it ourselves. We've created jobs. We have uh, eight young fellows working in the shop here who were unemployed before uh, they came to work for us. I've been asked continuously since I first invented the system, will it work anywhere? Currently, the system is in operation in 15 U.S. states, Canada, Mexico, Switzerland, Iran, soon in Argentina, and Australia. I think we've probably proven the fact that uh, if it will work in Calgary, Canada, at 40 below, it'll work anywhere. Jim Piper is making a go of it in business terms. And here's a gentleman that knows all about that, too. 
He used to be on the building and selling side of solar systems. Now he's on the financial side as a vice president of San Diego Federal Savings and Loan Association. He's Peter Sardagna, and he knows some of the financial problems that folks face in starting up a new industry. Okay, we at San Diego Federal, we pursue solar financing quite aggressively. We have developed one of the most uh, innovative programs for financing single-family residence equipment. We're also uh, promoting financing large tracks. As an example, we're uh, financing for one developer some 500 homes, all of which will have uh, domestic solar hot water heating. Most of these homes are solar heated to one extent or another. Uh, this one has solar domestic hot water heating. Others have uh, total space heating systems in them. All of the systems are providing the amount of energy that they were designed for and are doing well. There are some problems, however, and they're mostly economic. Solar has a difficult time uh, competing against uh, conventional fuels that have received subsidies for years, or in the case of natural gas, that is artificially uh, controlled and kept low. Uh, we look on the industry as just crossing the threshold of economic feasibility, and we think that these problems uh, time will solve. The solution lies in the eventual raise of conventional fuels that will make solar competitive. The exciting part of uh, solar today is that those systems that do work and those systems which are economically feasible result in something very beautiful for the homeowner. He can, at the end of the month, write a check measurably less than he did the month before the system was installed. That is exciting. That is news that will be spread, uh, word of mouth, and that's what, how the industry will get off the ground. Systems that work is the key. And there are other people all over the country that believe the future is now. People who are doing things on their own. There's a wide variety of people in our research group. We have mechanical engineers, electronics people, physicists, carpenters, shipwrights. We've had the barge for four years now, and slowly we've been developing the renewable energy systems that will make this independent of outside energy sources. Bjorn Lundy lives in Seattle. He studied at the University of Washington and is now an architectural designer. His project is under development on a barge at Anchor in Lake Washington. Uh, we've chosen a mobile floating facility so that we can uh, move around to different environmental conditions and so also that we can uh, demonstrate that no matter what locality you're in, there's uh, appropriate uh, energy or enough energy right there, right where you are, to put together your own independent energy systems. Uh, we're also very interested in this teaching aspect. We've gotten a research grant from the Seattle City Light now to develop a study program for grade school children, uh, teaching them about renewable energy. They're going to be the energy users in 1990, so we want to get them started uh, recognizing some of these issues. Here we've built a solar glass wall, which will passively heat the, uh, the deck house. We have to finish closing the deck house in first, so we're still in the process. And then eventually we'll have some uh, water storage drums inside here to hold the heat uh, for longer periods. Uh, so this will be a part of a passive heating system for the deck house. Uh, here we've got our model of a solar distillation uh, apparatus for distilling uh, fresh water, drinking water, uh, from any kind of water, brackish, uh, we could even use the bilge water. And what's coming out the nozzle down here is distilled water, and the energy used uh, is just solar energy. We're studying how much water we can get out of this model uh, over what period of time with this kind of sunlight. This is our uh, windmill. We've uh, put this together from renewed uh, recycled materials. It's uh, state-of-the-art technology with uh, uh, recycled materials controlled by the microprocessor computer. Uh, that generates the electricity for our house lights, anchor lights, all the electrical systems on board. We're really excited about our big parabola. Here's uh, Cliff Cox is uh, doubling as a foil applicator. Normally he's one of our computer experts. Here we see uh, an example of using low cost materials, aluminum foil, less than two cents a square foot, to achieve a really highly reflective surface. That'll be focusing the sun's energies on the focal point. 
and uh, that's where we'll put our Stirling engine. The Stirling engine then will uh, produce electric power. It's the way we have to go for a lot of reasons. Not all of them are economic or scientific, or a lot of them has to do with the quality of our lives. This is a vertical axis wind turbine. In other words, it's a windmill. It captures the wind and converts it into electricity. Gardner Green and the people of his company in Laconia, New Hampshire, built this one. And they're building others for a living, for profit. This vertical axis wind turbine was developed by a Frenchman about 50 years ago by the name of Darius. It attracted little attention until the energy crunch. Gar Green is a successful businessman who has now turned his abilities to a new opportunity in the solar industry. The world in the future. This is a scale model of an old farm windmill of which they sold hundreds of thousands all over the country. Uh, primarily used to pump water because it's, it's primarily a slow speed device. And it, as you can see, has a tail vane to keep it oriented into the wind, whereas our vertical axis wind turbines uh, don't care which way the wind blows and therefore are, are non-directional. One of the many advantages of the Darius is that it can be easily stacked. This is a new solar conscious plant in the Clearwater, Florida. And as you can see, a triple stack Darius is providing three times as much power as a single stack unit would. We can actually stack uh, many more than three. This sketch shows uh, two double stacks, each stack feeding its own alternator. And then where we have a prevailing wind, uh, we can have power station array of stacked units. And there could be many, depending on the wind conditions. In the future, there certainly will be a large use of individual wind turbines in individual homes. At the present time, the equipment is a little too sophisticated, but as mass production is achieved and prices go down and equipment becomes more simplified, the many homes throughout America will be able to use the wind. Solar collectors and wind turbines go hand in hand. For when the sun doesn't shine, the wind usually blows. The Energy Task Force is a private, nonprofit group of architects, engineers, and educators who provide energy-related technical assistance to low-income people around New York City. We formed around the rehabilitation of this urban homesteading cooperative here at 519 East 11th Street. Since the beginning of the industrial age, we have learned to rely more and more on technology. Ted Finch in New York City is trying to make technology work for the community on a human scale. Realizing that long-term occupancy of the building is largely dependent upon reducing fuel bills, we showed the tenants how to properly weatherize the structure. Once this was accomplished, we showed them how to install a rooftop wind generator and solar hot water heating system to further reduce bills. As a harbor city, New York is fortunate enough to have some tremendous offshore breezes. We plan to utilize this natural resource with the installation of a wind energy conversion system. The wind generator will provide electricity to aerate these compost piles. The compost will be provided to community groups for vacant lot gardens. There's a vicious cycle at work here, but it can and has been broken through tenant ownership. What's exciting about what we're doing here on the Lower East Side with these solar technologies is that uh, low-income people traditionally have not been on the cutting edge of developing new technologies. With these installations, such as 519 and at Quando, the low-income people have the opportunity to learn new skills in this developing solar economy. 
Taekwondo is a neighborhood group of black and Hispanic youth who have built the first passive solar energy system here in New York City. This demonstration of passive solar energy is a wonderful example of appropriate technology in that youth from the neighborhood with almost no skills installed this system. It requires little to no maintenance, which is very important. From a purely energy point of view, it's much more energy efficient to rebuild the existing housing stock than to put up whole new structures. They are pioneers, these people. There could be no more appropriate place for pioneers than here. The New Life Farm near Drury, Missouri, down in the Ozarks near the Arkansas border. Ted Landers is the driving force here. Educated in the East, he's lived in the big cities most of his life, until now. He and his family now live among the independent-minded folks of the Ozarks, and that suits Ted just fine. My reason for New Life Farm is to try to bring low-cost technology to the people who really need it. If we're successful at bringing technology that works to these people here and that actually increases their standard of living for not very much money, then for sure it's going to apply in a, in a more affluent farming community. This is our hydraulic ram. It's a pump that pumps water using no external sources of energy. There's no electricity that runs to this, no natural gas. The only thing that drives it is a spring that's up the hollow about 230 feet and is 12 feet higher than this ram. The 12-foot head that drives the ram pumps the water 150 feet all the way up to the top of the hill where the digester is. So it supplies all the water that the digester needs, all the water that the garden needs, all the water that the vineyard and the orchard needs, and all the water that the house needs. It'll pump somewhere between 1,000 and 3,000 gallons per day depending on the flow rate of the spring. It is really epitomizes the whole concept of appropriate technology. In the Ozarks and at New Life Farm, dual utilization of the land can be achieved by using hay for the biomass fuel crop and any a number of different trees for the feed crop. The beauty of biomass is that it's a great way to store solar energy. In the New Life Farm Digester Laboratory, we take water, we take the hay, we could add manure or soybean vines, corn stalks, any other kind of agricultural waste products, and put it in these tanks. Out of the tanks comes methane gas, which is a very clean burning fuel, which everybody knows affectionately is natural gas. Half the homes in the United States are heated with natural gas. Not only can we heat homes with it, but we can run gas refrigerators, gas hot water heaters, gas stoves, and we can even convert diesel generators to make electricity off of methane gas. The utilities currently have one big problem, and that is supplying peak demand. In the summertime at 4 o'clock, when everybody's got their air conditioners turned on, the utilities have to have all of their generators running in order to meet that demand. If many, many farmers had digesters that they could store up their gas through a 24-hour period, and then at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, or whenever the utility wants it, they could turn on their generators and supply electricity into the grid, it would solve one of the utility's most pressing problems. This facility here has allowed us to comparatively test 35 different configurations of absorber plates. We've used common materials, something anybody can get a hold of, such as beverage cans, uh, plaster lath, aluminum roofing, etc. From our research, we've developed a low-cost, inexpensive collector and system that costs around $3 per square foot for the materials. We've had five workshops this last year teaching people in their communities how to build these. The workshops have been very successful. Somebody always ends up with a collector built on the house, and the rest of the people that come to the workshop go away with the knowledge of how to build it. We're trying to teach people how to take control of their lives. Pioneers in pioneer country. Independence is what the New Life Farm is all about. But pioneer country is everywhere, and the frontiers of this expanding horizon of biosolar energy can be found lots of places in this country. Rudy Gunnerman chose Eugene, Oregon, because that's where he found millions of tons of waste materials that he believed could be put to use as a viable alternative energy source. What you're looking at here is called Widex. It's a man-made fuel which is made from fibrous waste. 
that means anything that grows in nature, which the sun helps to grow, can be converted into a high potency fuel, such as you see here in my hand. This is a renewable source of energy, and each ton of this product produced can replace three barrels of oil, or we generate the same BTU output per each ton of product or three barrels of oil would generate. Except it is not just renewable, it's also cleaner than oil because there's no sulfur in this product. We take fiber waste as it comes either from the forest or from sawmills or from the fields. We disintegrate it into powder or in the powder form. Then we take the free water off, bring it down in a rotating drum dryer or any type of dryer to a moisture consistency of approximately 20%. Then we are taking it to a pelletizing process. It is a high temperature process where the temperature is being generated through compression and moisture. In this process, we then separate the lignites and waxes, which are within a fiber product using those as binders and have the cellulose structure within this product free for combustion. In our own manufacture, we use about 10% of the BTUs produced in our own process. The waste in the United States are tremendously large. We have in excess of a billion and a half tons of waste available. That does not mean that we can all use it, but if we could use the total waste or cl close to the total waste, it would be enough energy to produce 20 quarts of new energy, or it would be actually more energy than we are today importing in oils. All across the land, these American innovators are joined by their industrial counterparts, large and small, who are producing a wide variety of solar and other renewable energy equipment for the mass market. These combined efforts will have a major economic impact on the entire industry, indeed on the entire country. Yes, this pioneering spirit is found everywhere and in all kinds of places. An abandoned laundromat in San Bernardino, east of Los Angeles, is being used as a very special sort of shop, a place where they're building solar energy systems. One of the positive byproducts of any new industry is that new jobs are created. So it is with the Community Development Corporation and the person behind this unusual project is Valerie Pope. Here in San Bernardino, California, we're installing solar skylight water heaters. We're, we're installing them on public housing for low-income people. The housing is owned by the County of San Bernardino. We also install the same kind of solar hot water heaters on houses owned by the handicapped and other low-income heads of households. We see the, the solar industry as a new technology. It's an opportunity for the people here at CDC and people like us throughout the country, small backyard inventors, small businessmen, to take a chance at the all-American dream. It's an opportunity for us to invent solar systems that are unique and appropriate to the areas where we work. Developing, designing, and manufacturing, installing, and maintenance of solar systems are fairly simple. We have people in our organization that have some engineering background, but basically we're lay people. And if we can do it, most anyone can. Now we manufacture all of the components for our solar systems that we install throughout the city and county of San Bernardino. We not only manufacture the skylight solar hot water heaters, but we manufacture the flat plate collectors, which we sell to other solar programs. We attempt to give the people in training here a wide variety of skills in the energy-related fields. In our first solar project, we provided heat and hot water for 10 houses. We found that we had an excess amount of energy and we decided to build greenhouses. We chose the hydroponic greenhouse for the first one in order to provide our trainees with an exposure to a new technology such as hydroponics. These are some of the plants that we grow here. 
We did promise you an interesting cast, remember? They're interesting because they're doing something important, something you could be doing in the days ahead, because our government will be encouraging communities to expand solar energy programs. We can join the pioneers who are already learning to use wind or hydroelectric or biomass or the direct rays of the sun as another source of energy. The Secretary of Energy has said that there will be a great adventure for this country as we move into the next century and as we turn increasingly to renewable sources of energy as a replacement for fossil fuels. At the end of that great adventure, solar energy will take its place as a vital and long-term energy source. These small-scale, decentralized technologies have to be combined with energy conservation. If we can be more efficient, we won't have to produce as much energy, thereby helping the environment, reducing our dependence on foreign sources, and making our society far less vulnerable to natural or man-caused disasters. Decentralized energy technology is, by its very nature, community-based. Contact the people in your community who are pioneering this great adventure. For further information about alternative energy technology, contact the United States Department of Energy, Technical Information Center, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, 37830. Hello everybody, I'm Skip Alzheimer. Welcome to the AV Geeks Lunchtime Streaming Show. Um, this is a pre-recorded show, and the reason why it's pre-recorded is because one, we don't have any power, two, we don't have a decent internet where we can stream, three, I might be on vacation, four, um, hmm, I don't know. I'm sick. I don't know. I slept in. Who knows? Um, anyways, um, so I collect old 16 millimeter films and show them to folks like you. And um, we just saw great uh, the solar energy great adventure. Eddie Albert, man. Eddie Albert was a uh, very progressive uh, filmmaker and also a proponent of solar energy. And also a proponent of um, sex ed films. He, he actually helped make a bunch of sex ed films and actually made a bunch of films for uh, AT&T early on, too. Um, interesting guy, really. Um, more than just uh, his Green Acres and his Longest Yard um, actor roles. Um, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, you saw that address at the end. I went to that uh, pavilion and actually went, they had a breeder reactor there. They're supposedly the first reactor that made the United States that they um, made. Uh, I don't know what they did. I can't remember what they were actually um, making. They were making rods, enriched uranium rods. And um, so I got, as a kid, I went to this summer camp that was at a college and we went there and we had to all wear the little badges, the photo badges that have um, a little strip of film in them and if they show up developed that means that you were exposed to too much radiation so I remember actually leaning over and looking at the glow in the, the pond the pool where the um, uh, uranium was and supposedly I got radioactive grease on me so that explains it um, anyways so uh, today our theme is power and uh, this next film is a wonderful uh, Warner Brothers film 
um, that makes you think that uh, everything that's great about the United States is related to the energy industry. So here's Power Behind the Nation. Enjoy. a powerful nation, found on faith and equality. Men and women came here, fleeing the oppression and poverty of the old world, seeking freedom, looking for a better chance in life in the new. Through the years, the urge for independence, personal and political, grew into the American spirit, a living force that is the foundation of our power today, an urge toward wider horizons that is still pushing on. Vigor of mind and body we owe to inheritance from the pioneers who carved the beginnings of our nation out of the wilderness with back-breaking toil, clearing farms, draining swamps, building their homes, mills, and towns, with Bible, axe, and plow, braving hardship and death. They settled the great Central Valley, and generation by generation pushed on across the trackless prairie, over the grasslands to the mountains, through the passes to the promised land. Following the star of freedom, they opened the way for the millions who poured in after them to settle the West, link the oceans with roads, and finally rail for the swift iron horse. And so was built for us a mighty nation, mightiest in the world, a productive power unequaled anywhere else, built up by free Americans for free Americans. Today, New Yorker and California, Midwest farmer, rancher of the great far west, Yankee fisherman, southern tobacco grower, craftsman, and laborer, industrial worker, artist, men and women in all walks of life. We are shareholders in the greatest enterprise on earth, the United States of America Unlimited. Our strength, character of our people, young in heart, dependent in thought and nature, skilled of hand, inventive, industrious, and creating. All these go into the shaping of an American out of this great melting pot of races and people. The highest class of skilled craftsmen has been developed by American labor and industry. American enterprise has harnessed fire and water, wind, sun, and soil to produce an abundance of everything. Giant turbines, generators, motors, Turn the wheels of production throughout the land. Factories seethe with steam, flare with flame, belch smoke and fume, roar and strain, night and day, to produce more and more of the vital materials and the commodities of this industrial age. From the earliest dawn of civilization, commerce and trade have determined a nation's standard of living. Production and distribution are the backbone of commerce, providing the jobs and goods and services for the nation. In mass production, this nation has no equal. The automotive industry, the assembly line, turning out so many things so fast from interchangeable parts. So vast and varied is our power to produce to meet every material need of man we can glimpse only a few of the highlights of the complex picture of our industry. Trace here the more colorful strands that make up the endless pattern of American production and distribution, the fabric of our power and plenty. We have a wealth of natural resources, nature's gifts to this fortunate land. Out of mines, 70,000 of them comes coal, essential for an industrial nation the source of so much of our power and strength. 
We mine more coal using more labor-saving devices like this coal cutter than any other people. This black treasure from the earth is blasted. Crushed, transported to supply power to transform raw materials into thousands of things of beauty and everyday use. Coal feeds the fires of industry forging the riches of the nation with an inconceivable volume of searing heat to make steel, most useful of metal. Molten steel pouring from boiling cauldrons, an inferno of white flame, black smoke and fume rising from stack and chimney. That spells production, mounting high and higher raising our standard of living as it mounts. Produce plenty and we shall have plenty. Never has man had the power to produce for his needs as we have that power today. Pits and quarries and oil fields disgorge a multitude of substances, fuel, copper, granite, building stone, high-grade iron ore. We have dug deeply from the earth to replenish the nation and a world in need, as here in the largest open pit mine in the world. Tremendous masses of crude materials have been mastered, making glass, melting aluminum, purifying, Beating, molten copper, cast, rolled, drawn, spun, from thin wire to burnished cable. Not only in the treasure below the earth are we fortunate, but reaching to the sky in soaring perpendiculars is another rich gift of nature. Our magnificent forest. and beautify our land, we must plant another tree for every one we cut. Pugging, giant redwood sections on the way to the mill. Pine cut with precision, converted into lumber by ingenious power-driven machines. Lumber for American homes, countless uses. For pulpwood, millions of tons a year to be processed into the paper we use so lavishly. By still other intricate machinery, paper is invested with color and ink. The press, a free press, a powerful protection to a democracy is the right to information as guaranteed to us by the Constitution. Our press, augmented by radio, communicates truth, knowledge, and understanding to our people and to all the peoples of the world. The ever-expanding scope of the motion picture that breaks through the barriers of language and nationality to entertain, to speak in the universal tongue of music, and to educate, a powerful medium for the diffusion of knowledge and goodwill among men and nations, to help build a peaceful world. Now let's take a look at our peaceful fields of fertile earth and living green. Lucky man, the farmer, grows his own groceries, shares nature's bounty and beauty rests in the shade of his own California vine or Georgia peach tree. By means of tractor and harvester and combine, by improved machinery, 
and tools and equipment. Our farm production is prodigious. Grain from the Middle West, cotton from the South. Every section of the country has its special product. From the Northeast, rich maple sugar. From the Northwest, fine wool for your winter coat. From the Southwest, hides, leather for your shoes, and meat, and food. A power for peace in a hungry world. Abundant production being further increased by improved methods of soil conservation, by the magic of water. Here, a giant man-made canal detours billions of gallons to acres that never bloomed before, transforms them into wide expanse of rich green fields to yield a bountiful harvest. A tremendous stream of food from every part of the land rolls to market on the wheels of a transportation system unequaled anywhere in the world. A salute to American enterprise, engineering skill, capital, and labor that has built up and constantly improves our vast network of railways, highways with their fleets of trucks, our system of waterways, shipping, canals for inland transportation, breathtaking bridges, and for air transport, the plane, an American invention that has shrunk time and distance, brought continents within a night's journey of each other. Conquest of the air, we are only beginning to comprehend its power. We have put rivers to work, harnessed the flood, with gigantic dams of concrete and steel to make power, electric power, white coal for industry. River current transformed into electric current, carried from powerhouse over the miles to your house, to the houses of industry. Electricity powers this modern robot which shapes a formless mass into delicate glass tumblers with fantastic ease. And without the touch of human hand, performs an unbelievably intricate task with rhythm and precision. Turns out the finished article by the thousand. Colors, dyes, plastics, synthetics, magic in the industrial arts. Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed as one of us in this age of invention and applied science. Yes, since Benjamin Franklin first discovered electricity, we have come a long way in mastering and directing this wizard force to make power and light. But nations do not live by their material power alone. Our basic principles of government by the people, with liberty in law, our free institutions, faith in God and man. There is a real power behind the nation. Whether this American way of life, this last best hope of earth shall endure, is up to us. Farmer and mechanic, teacher, doctor, businessman, and banker. What are we doing to strengthen our great heritage? Today, the peace of the world depends on the stability of the United States. The nation's strength depends upon the wisdom, the work, and the thrift of the people. Our security is the nation's security. That is why our treasury urges us to save purity. Can regularly in United States savings bonds the safest investment on earth, our shares in the future strength and prosperity of America, the land we own, the land we love. What difference if I hail from north or south, or from the east or west, my heart is filled with love for all of thee. Oh, glory, take the 
last shot. Wow. Actually, the the whole film is filled with uh, really beautifully choreographed frame shots. Um, I mean, it's Warner Brothers. Um, plus, it's like the oil industry, so they have a bunch of money, a whole bunch of money. Um, this next film is by our favorite, uh, Jam Handy. Jam Handy's company was based in Detroit and made lots of industrial and sponsored films for GM, for uh, Westinghouse, for lots and lots of companies. Um, and this one is is very indicative of of the a uh, Jam Handy film. This would have been probably shown at uh, GM or Chevy dealerships, but also pro could have maybe been shown in movie theaters. Um, it's entertaining. It's informational. It's got some great um, animation in it and. Uh, so it's an ad, you know, so it's an ad for uh, GM products. So here's power. Enjoy. <laughs> When man first harnessed the muscles of an progress, that was the beginning of his dominion on Earth. The power of man depends upon his ability to develop, convert, and apply power. The power to lift, the power to drive, the power to pull. And the most widely used power plant of all, the automobile, supplies the power to move ourselves, our families, and all the merchandise in the world. Together, all the automobiles in the world develop over 173 million horsepower, more than all the horses and oxen on Earth. Where does this power come from? From explosions. Not the wild, unharnessed explosion of dynamite, but controlled explosions of gasoline in regular, rhythmic, recurrent impulses. How does the burning of a drop of fuel in the automobile engine become power? Power starts in the cylinder, where burning gasoline forces the piston downward. If you take a short piece of cast iron pipe, smoothed out inside, close it up at one end, and fit a plunger in the other end, you have something very similar to the automobile piston in its cylinder. If you put a little gasoline inside the closed end, then set a match to it, your plunger piston will fly off into space like a cannonball. The piston in the automobile engine would act in exactly the same way if it were not harnessed. So to convert the motion of the piston into circular motion, the piston is attached by a connecting rod which carries the power to a crank. The operation of an automobile engine is something like pedaling a bike. The motion of your legs as you force the pedals downward compares to the downward thrust of the piston. Your feet and the pedals make up the connecting rod and crank of your engine. You exert only on the down strokes. You rest on the up strokes. But with an automobile engine, there is only one power stroke to every four strokes of the piston. For every four times the piston travels through the cylinder, only one stroke is useful. The first downward stroke sucks gas and air into the combustion chamber of the cylinder. The upward compresses the mixture of gas. On the third stroke, the compressed vapors are ignited and explosion forces a downward stroke. Power is applied. The fourth stroke pushes the burned gases out. This is known as four cycle action. One, intake, two, compression, three, power, four, exhaust. An opening somewhere near the top of the cylinder lets in the gas from the carburetor. And another opening allows the burned gases to escape through the exhaust after the explosion. When the gas is being drawn into the cylinder, 
the opening to the exhaust is closed airtight. On the compression and explosion strokes of the piston, both openings are closed. And when the burned gases are being forced out, the intake opening is closed. The opening and closing of the gas inlet and exhaust is accomplished by means of valve. Each piston in your engine goes through all four cycles about 1,500 times in every mile, and only one stroke carries the car forward. To bring the piston back in place again on the three extra strokes, the crank has a flywheel attached to it. The downward stroke of the piston sets the flywheel in motion which carries the piston along for the other three strokes. A one-cylinder engine needs a very large flywheel to take care of the three extra strokes, and uneven power causes a jerky motion in the movement of the crank. With a four-cylinder engine, the four cranks are connected together on a shaft called the crankshaft. With four pistons working, jerkiness is cut down. With six cylinders, the power strokes overlap, and the continuous flow of power easily carries the other pistons on their three extra strokes. The large flywheel of the one-cylinder engine is no longer necessary. Power doesn't depend on the number of cylinders, but on how efficiently the gasoline mixture is burned in each cylinder. Now, with six cylinders, you have no pause between explosions. Each power stroke starts before the previous one is exhausted, and you get complete overlapping smoothness and the greatest gasoline economy. Explosions in the cylinders move the piston, but they also make the pistons hot. As you know, all metals expand when heated, but cast iron pistons expand the same as the cast iron cylinder block, so they always fit closely, regardless of engine operating conditions and prevent knocks and waste of oil. From the engine, power goes through the transmission, along the propeller shaft, through the differential and rear axle, and turns the wheels of the car. The harnessing of energy in the automobile engine puts power at the driver's command. Power to meet every need of modern individual transportation. <laughs> wonderful and um you know so i got that film from a school system and so i'm sure that it was donated to them by a local gm dealer and they thought it was important enough it had some information in there that they could pull out the educational material and show it to kids or high school students or community college students that talk about uh, pistons and, and, and all that so um, pretty great stuff. Uh, this next uh, film is just a commercial, and it's about power, so here we go. Did you think you could get clothes clean in cold water, Mrs. Spears? No, but Jeff gets into our Georgia red clay, and he picks up all sorts of stains, and hot water can set some of them in, so I tried coal power. And? Look how clean it gets his pants. I do everything in coal power. Even diapers? Sure, I understand it germ-proofs. You're right. Laboratory tests have shown that cold power germ-proofs and gets out the worst kind of dirt in cold water. There you go. <laughs> it's just a short commercial. <coughs> All right. Uh, I, one of the reasons I collect films like this is because I truly enjoy showing them to folks like you, you know, the chance to see something you've never seen before. Um, and I hope you like it so much that you will consider liking it. 
uh, that you will also consider maybe get, buying us some coffee because uh, caffeine is the drug of choice and coffee is what makes AV Geeks run. So uh, thanks to anybody that has actually bought us coffee today. Um, thank you. Um, I'll give a real shout out the next time that I am live to all the people who uh, bought us coffee. Also, avgeeks.com has previous episodes of this show and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of uh, films that we've uploaded, individual films. So this next film is one of my favorites. Um, it's guaranteed this is the only copy of it in existence. Um, it's a home movie, basically. Uh, it came in a box of uh, things I got on eBay that said, a uh, box of films from Energy Company. I was like, oh, this is interesting. So I got um, Electric uh, Heating Goes to School, which I showed on here a couple of weeks ago. Um, what else? There's a helicopter erecting power uh, transmitter, um, which is basically one of the giant pylons, high tension line pylons. Uh, and then this film, which it was written on the can, Ohio Power Company Vet Party 1951. And um, so this film is silent. It's about nine minutes. And it starts slow, tedious, but it builds into some insanity. Um, so it's silent. I would play music over it, but chances are whatever music I would pick would be flagged for copyright. And uh, since this is a pre recorded thing, it would be hard for me to figure out how to restart it and all that stuff. It would be a nightmare. So go ahead and just find something you want to play um, and watch this. This is really phenomenal. This is one of the reasons I collect film. Um, so here it is. Ohio Power Company, the Vet Party 1951. Enjoy.
All right. So I'm hoping that that blew your mind as much as it blew my mind the first time I saw it. Um, so strange. And it has that slow buildup and then the insanity and then it's time to have a banquet. So my guess is that this was some sort of initiation ceremony. Um, some great party tricks there. Um, really quite, quite a bit of fun. So hopefully you liked it. Um, it's, I hold it very close to my heart. And it's really why I collect films and, and why I will buy things on eBay and not really know what they are. And, and it's usually the things that I don't know what they are where those are the, the most amazing films um, that I was like, I didn't know this type of thing existed. Same with used books. Like, <clears throat> excuse me, used books, you know, I don't go to the places, I go to like the dollar bin or the free section, and I just look through and see like what there is, and I found phenomenal things. Also book sales, like library sales. I don't go on the first day, I go on the last day when it's like super cheap, and the stuff I find is, it's, I didn't know it existed, it's really phenomenal. Um, all right, so, one last film. Uh, this is National Film Board of Canada, which is a pretty great uh, organization. Uh, basically, filmmakers would make proposals and get grants to make their films. And um, many of the animated films actually have either a cultural or historical or educational value beyond whatever they're doing. And this is an example of that. This is a film that is about the dangers of electricity uh, related to fire. It's called Hot Stuff. So enjoy. Sorry about that. That kind of ended suddenly. What a great film. Um, Where's the cream? <laughs> That's my favorite part. It resonates with me. In fact, I say that about other things now. Where's the pie? Um, thanks, everybody, for tuning in today. I'm sorry that it was pre-recorded, but remember, <clears throat> either we didn't have any power, um, we didn't have decent internet, um, I'm on vacation, or, I don't know, I slept in, I'm sick, um, I got bored, got involved in something else, who knows. But um, thanks for tuning in and commenting, and hopefully I'm actually there watching along and commenting with you. Um, as a reminder, if you like what you saw, you can uh, press like or subscribe. Um, we love coffee, so buy us a coffee, or two, or three, or four. Um, and avgeeks.com is a great place to look and see other things that we have um, online, DVDs that we have for sale, etc., etc. You guys have a good rest of the day. Um, if it's Friday, I will see you on Monday. If it is uh, another weekday, um, I'll see you tomorrow. Uh, I think, you know. Uh, if one of those three or four problems I listed earlier still persist, it might be another uh, pre-recorded thing. But thanks again, and uh, be kind to yourself, be kind to your friends and family, and we'll talk soon. All right, bye.